my choice, right? Great. Hi, um, my name's Alastair. Some of you may have read me or encountered me as Angus. I, I hope this talk, because I'm aware we're running a little bit late, I hope so, and I've got a few things I want to say, so I hope it doesn't sound like having a conversation with a crazy person at a bus stop. <laughs> it's like, and then the other thing is, um, if you would like to see me in slow motion crazy, just to confirm, then you can see me talk on Benjamin Boyce. So in brief, I entered this space because I came into contact with a group of parents of boys. There was, a, it was the time was the release of irreversible damage. There was a lot of attention on the girls. Every parent of a boy that I met was delighted by that. And then, and, and we would also like some kind of analysis of what's going on with the young men. So I interviewed them. John Kay from Quillette took, I don't know why, but he took a chance on me and said yes and published it. It then turned out, this is a very rapid version that I live half an hour from Stella as a complete coincidence. We live in the same pretty sparsely populated part of the world. Uh, so then I joined Genspect and, uh, as the managing director, I'm now the, the vice director. So for me, that's kind of one part of the story. The other part of the story is that as a young man, I was groomed online. And when I came into this, I genuinely didn't expect grooming to be a part of this story, but it is. Um, it is. It is possibly in a way which is different for the young men than it is for the young women, and possibly not. I don't know. I know less about the young women but I was groomed. I reacted to that by spending 15 years as an online pedophile hunter. Two men went to prison as a result of that, that I know of, maybe more, one in Arkansas and one in Delaware. Um, so maybe my subconscious mind was going, this is grooming, this is grooming, this is grooming. I don't know, or maybe it wasn't. One of the parents I interviewed her son was her son was 15 and he was being encouraged by a 28 year old man oh. to say well hatred of your testicles is normal because you know you're a girl um and you know it could be sexy to hit them but i'll watch just in case now these are people that when i say pedophile hunter that sounds ridiculously uh, i don't know what the word is courageous or something. It's just staying up all night, obsessively reporting accounts, mainly. And I realized, wow, now they can just say gender. They can just say gender. They can just say, well, this person has gender dysphoria. So it's fine to encourage uh, self-torture. Um, I'm still in contact with that mother and the boy got to 18 and then moved in with the groomer. So I then decided to start speaking about grooming as well in, in this context. And I'm fully aware that that's a part of this very complicated situation, which explains one thing. I, what I want to say really, and I don't want to talk too long, is uh, since then something else has happened to me, which is that I've been diagnosed with terminal cancer and I have probably only a few months to live, but we don't know. Um, by the way, none of you know how many months you've got to live. I know, it's quite a leveling thought. Um, I remember once saying to an oncologist before all of this, how many of your patients die? She's like, all of them. <laughs> like, oh yeah, all of them. Um, and what I want to do is I want to speak directly to people at WPATH and DPATH. So I've been through I've been through radiotherapy, I've been through chemotherapy, I've been through cardiac care, and I'm now going through immunotherapy, and you meet nurses, clinicians, radiotherapy technicians, uh, you know, surgeons, you meet the people who bring you toast, you meet the cleaners, and you meet lots of people. And so they ask me what I do. Um, and so I would say um, I'm, I work with a uh, not-for-profit organization which wants to protect gender non-conforming young people from un inappropriate medicalization. And I've said that, and I've had that conversation with, I don't know, 100 people, maybe, in this country, Ireland. And 
I would say one person was a bit, mm, bit, bit strange, kind of was a bit wary. About 10 people have said that sounds incredibly valuable. Now, they, these, are, these are clinicians, and I'm not dropping anyone in it. I'm not, I'm not naming anyone. And they're from lots of different backgrounds. But the main thrust of the message is, this is an abnormal sector of the healthcare system. It's abnormal. It's become, I don't know enough to know whether it's become abnormal, whether it always was abnormal. But your colleagues, and I, I want to say this to people at EPATH and WPATH, your colleagues think you're abnormal. So I go into my clinician and I say, and she says, how are you? How is your, how much exercise are you doing? Are you socializing? Are you seeing, how much are you seeing friends? How are your relationships with your family? She just gets a picture off of me. Um, she asks me, so exercise, she might ask me about alcohol consumption. She'll ask me about diet. She'll ask me about weight loss, weight gain. She doesn't do that because I'm particularly interesting and she doesn't do that because she's nosy. She does that because she's treating me. She's treating my disease, but she's treating me. So I want you all to imagine something. I want you all to imagine that I went in and she said, how are you? And I said, well, I had gin for breakfast. Um, I'm not speaking to any of my friends. I've ditched all my family. Um, don't exercise but all this will be better when you make my stage four cancer go away. Now it would, that's not a theory. My life would be in all that, I don't have some hypothesis, the grass is greener, like mm, cancer me, not cancer me, who knows? No, 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 this isn't hypothetical. You know, there's a 92% chance that I'll make it to sort of maybe new year and I'm 40. So there's no question. So imagine I went in and I said that, and I was like, well, everything's fallen to pot. So it's all gone wrong. Diet's gone wrong, not exercising, socialism. The whole thing, socializing, it's gone wrong. But you cure me, you cure me, and it'll all be fine. It would be totally inappropriate for her to say, okay, cool, here's your next appointment. What would be appropriate is for her to say, back up, we need to get you some help here. We need to work with our colleagues. So we need to get a dietitian in here. If you're, if you're telling me like you're eating absolute junk, that's gonna compromise your ability to recover, to be treated. We need to maybe get you in touch with a psychotherapist, maybe a specialist, maybe it's a specialist, whatever it might be. It might be grief, it might be this. You need to talk, we need to talk, get you talking about your friends and your family and so forth. That is what she would have to do. She would have to formulate an exercise plan. She would have to do something to show that she cares about me. The people at EPATH and WPATH, your colleagues think you're weird because you won't work with them. Why won't you work with them? Why is it the case that when somebody has an eating disorder, you won't fully, certainly not in America from what I can see, work with them? Because it's inappropriate. It's inappropriate, for example, to say to a young person, oh, hey, okay, you want to change gender um, and, you, and you're a swimmer. Well, that's fine. We'll just, you know, we'll give you a sex change and then it's your problem. Because there's transphobia in society. So if you want to swim, you have to go out there and solve that. This is vending machine medicine. This is not whole person medicine. You treat the person in front of you. You care. You ask, how are you? Now, I know that there are many people who do believe that the administration of puberty blockers and hormones is compatible with caring. I'm, I do not believe that this is an army of psychopaths and only awful people. I'm not saying that. But the truth is that medical excellence has to be the norm. And that means you work with your colleagues, you think about the whole outcome for the young person in front of you, not the next five years, not just what's the aesthetics, what, what's the look I'm achieving here. You think forward and you care and you care long-term. That is normal medical excellence. You have somebody in front of you. This is true of paramedics. This is true of emergency room triage people. This, this is true of dentists, right? You don't just say, oh, you want something? I'll give you that. 
I've had an argument with a dentist about whether I have this type of filling or that type of filling. Where they're like, well, no, it's better for you to have this type of filling. We cannot have vending machine medicine. And we have to understand that what's happened, I think particularly in America and Canada, has allowed a group of people who are not meeting the required standard to take over. And I want you to know, and when I say your colleagues think you're weird, I'm not, this is an abstract. I mean, they look at me and say, tactfully, because they're all very smart and, you know, they've all got MSCs, but they look at me and, and nod and say things like, we're hoping for change. They think you're weird and they think you're really bad at your jobs and they're probably right. And that's what I want to say to you. And I want to say one other thing and then I'm going to shut up because we're kind of running late. I hear an awful lot um, that these parents are probably, you know, they're coming for the gays next, right? And the, the pick me gays think that the evil transphobes won't come for the gay people next, right? I think a lot of people will have heard that, that we've been told we're very stupid. This is a deeply right-wing evil movement. And if you're gay and you talk to people who have qualms about pediatric transition, then you're a fool because they'll come for you next. And I want to say very quickly, since I got sick, my friends who've come from over the seas, they've crossed, they've crossed oceans on planes, they've spoken to me for many hours, they've sent me goodie packages in the post, they have been everything and I'm very proud and there's people here today that I'm proud to know. And how dare you imply that they're homophobic? I have not met one homophobic parent in all of this, I've met hundreds. I haven't met one. I think I met one who made a slightly clumsy comment. These people aren't homophobes. You're the homophobes. You're the homophobes. And here's all... And Ezel was right. You were right yesterday. There's, there's an ick factor. And you've convinced yourself, because you vote left wing, that it's like, oh, no, that couldn't be me. No, you're the homophobes. They're not homophobes. Not one of those parents you're accusing is of, of, of being some horrible right wing homophobe. They are my friends, and they have stood up for me. They've known from the beginning that I'm gay. I've always been open about it. They have gay nephews. They have gay friends. And they have gay children in many cases. And we, I think, are going to stop you because I think it's time that you shut it with that and you stop insulting people who have legitimate qualms and who have far more knowledge about their children than you do. And there is a huge and growing movement of gay people who have had enough and we're not gonna take it anymore. So that was the second thing I wanted to say. <laughs> And I think because we're running, I think we're running, obviously I've got a trillion more things I want to say, but we're running late, so I think we'll, we'll go on, will we? I think so. Thank you very much.